the subconscious that is like a faithful servant that is receiving all the images, all the thoughts, and then acting upon them. So if we wish to reprogram our subconscious mind, we have to start by sending proper messages with the conscious mind. This brings us to the first tool for reprogramming, which is self-talk. 95% of our emotions are determined by the self-talk that we do. For example, you're listening to me, there is self-talk going on. Why does he have a beard? <laughs> <laughs> what is the meaning of the orange that he's wearing? I agree with him, mm -hmm. he's got a point. No, maybe not. So there's constant self-talk that is going on. Now our self-image gets determined by the self-talk we do. Our attitudes get <coughs> determined by that. A salesperson has a task to do. He has to go and sell something. Now, his sales call was not successful. Somebody does positive self-talk. Okay, it is one call, the next one will be successful. Maybe he was not interested, but I have a good product. I'm sure I'll succeed next time. This leads to an optimistic attitude. Another person has negative self-talk. Oh, my sale was not successful. I don't know how to do it. I'm a failure. I can never do it. This kind of self-talk leads to a negative attitude. So self-talk is creating our emotions. Some people may contradict that and say, well, you know, Swamiji, I don't do any self-talk. But the fact is you do. At least you are aware of the external talk. When somebody cuts in front of your car, people talk to the car that is three blocks ahead. <laughs> Some people talk to the golf ball. Come on, come on, it's a little bit good. Yeah, you've done it. Children, they do their self-talk loudly. Once I was in somebody's house and a whole racket was getting created upstairs. I said, what is the party? And when I went up to the child's room, I found he had his toys around, the teddy bear, etc. and was speaking to them, having a gala time. Now as adults, we do the self-talk within ourselves. Some people don't. There are those who are mad. You find them talking as they go down the street. <laughs> but then, we don't fall in that category, yet the self-talk keeps happening within ourselves. And this self-talk makes such a difference. Our self-image gets created from that self-talk. I read about somebody who went to interview one of the most beautiful women of her times, Elizabeth Taylor. And he was astonished by her self-image. She said, my eyes are too far apart, my nose is not proper, and my thighs are like tree trunks, I don't like the way I look. He said, with that kind of self-talk, it is no wonder that her personal life was such a mess that she married some eight or ten times and each time it ended in a divorce. So this self-talk, if only it could be corrected, it would lead to a positive self-image, as was experienced by a person who later on became the head of Mensa for 40 years. This was Viktor Seribriakov. When he was 15 years old, his teacher told him that he did not have any intellect. He was very dull and would never amount to anything in his life. So Viktor Seripriyakov 
left his studies and for the next 17 years he engaged in menial labor in various places. His self-image was that I am dull and I will never amount to anything. However, at the age of 32, after 17 years, he took an army entrance test. So they also tested his IQ and they had a scale up to 161. So his IQ went way beyond. That means probably 1 in 50,000 or whatever. So they said that at least we know he is more than 161. That completely changed his self-image. His now self-talk was, oh, I am so intelligent. And the consequence was that he joined the Mensa. Mensa is the international society of the extremely intelligent. You need to be in the top 2% segment of intelligence to be a member of Mensa. You know, if you travel by American Airlines, they have the Mensa quiz in their in-house magazine. So, membership of Mensa had fallen to four. He lifted it up. He remained the head of it and made it a worldwide organization. He remained its head till the very end. He wrote many books on IQ and on uh, the lumberjack business. And he flourished merely by changing his self talk So, if we wish to change our subconscious, we can simply choose some positive affirmations. I am happy. I am relaxed. Life is good. I have received so many blessings. And as you keep repeating these again and again, you will find your subconscious will get reprogrammed. To give you another story with that illustrates the power of the subconscious. This is the story of the four minute mile. Until 1956, nobody had run the mile in less than four minutes. And everybody gave reasons why this cannot be done. But some doctors said, you just don't have enough lung power. Some said that if you try running faster, you will have a heart attack. And everybody believed that this cannot be done. So what was the self-talk? We can never break the four-minute barrier. And then, in 1956, there was a student of athletics called Roger Bannister. He said, I will break it. People discouraged him. Your timing is four minutes and six seconds. But he said, I will definitely do it. And the day he broke that barrier and ran the mile in less than four minutes, everybody's self-talk changed. Yes, it can be done. There is no reason why we can't do it. The consequence was that in that very year, 1956, 27 runners ran the mile in less than four minutes. And the next year, 1957, 235 runners ran the mile in less than four minutes. So, one powerful way of reprogramming your subconscious is to be aware of the conscious thoughts and to Repeat such messages which will help you become positive and optimistic. The different cultures of the world have emphasized a simple way of doing it. That is the way as a spiritualist we practice with every breath chant the names of God. That not only sends positive messages and vibrations it also helps in purifying the subconscious. A second tool. In English there is a saying, an image is worth a thousand words. The subconscious has its own way of thinking. 
in your conscious mind you are usually thinking with the help of words and sometimes when you increase the speed of your thoughts then you are thinking in terms of ideas but the subconscious doesn't think in terms of words it thinks in terms of emotions it thinks in terms of images so an image impacts the subconscious like nothing else this knowledge is repeatedly utilized in the sports arena because sports track and field is such an area of human performance where every fraction of a second counts and make can make the difference between a gold medal and a silver medal so to bring about that peak performance consciously you would need to control many million bodily processes the musculoskeletal system with 205 bones and 630 muscles but if the subconscious can take over then it does this instinctively and that is why in the sports arena practically all olympic level performers they utilize what is called the power of visualization best golfer of all time jack nicholas was asked what is the secret of his success he said i never ever hit a shot without first holding in my mind a clear image of where the hole is and the ball moving from the stick right into the hole with that image in my mind i hit and the subconscious becomes a friend of the conscious to ensure that little fine control which makes all the difference there's a sports psychologist in florida called john murray who has trained many olympic level <coughs> sports personalities and he says look if you need to serve in tennis first of all picture the court and picture the ball falling there because your conscious mind cannot control so many processes however if you let the image sink in the subconscious will come to help you i came across a very fascinating story in this regard there was a russian jew by the name of natan sharansky he was wrongly accused of being a cia agent and put into the worst russian jail the siberian jail so he describes that for 400 days he was in a little cell that was 5 feet by 6 feet now without any scope for activity there is a strong chance of body and mind degenerating in order to keep himself in good condition he thought of some mental exercise so he would play chess in the mind because that creates a tremendous mental exercise keeping the 64 squares and all the pieces so he used to play chess as a child and he said let's do this every day and with whom should he play in his mind why not play with the best person at that time the world chess champion was gary kasparov but every day he would play with kasparov in his mind and defeat him subsequently when bill clinton became the president on his request nathan sharansky was released from jail he went and started living in israel where he became a cabinet minister a little later gary kasparov was on a visit and he played a demonstration match in israel so these grandmasters they have five people 10 people against whom they play he had five and one of them was nate sharansky gary kasparov defeated four of them well just thank you but one person defeated him and that was Nathan Sarans later on reporters asked him how did you do it he said you know 
I was defeating him every day in my mind. For me, it was just a replay of what I had practiced again and again in my mind. And this was the power of visualization, which had created in the subconscious this conviction that yes, even the world chess champion can be defeated. So, in reprogramming our subconscious, if we utilize the proper kind of imagery, it can make all the difference, as was the experience of an American philosopher called Marmon Cousins. Has anybody heard the name Marmon Cousins? He has written a book called Anatomy of an Illness. In the 1970s, he was diagnosed with leukemia, blood cancer. And he decided that I have learned about mind control. Let me utilize its principles. Every day, he would visualize millions and millions of his WBCs, white blood corpuscles, attacking the cancer cells, eating them up. This was his daily practice. And the power of visualization unleashed the strength and the potential of the subconscious. The subconscious took over, brought about the required physical processes. He continued to live for another 20 years. And that's when he wrote this book, Anatomy of an Illness. So it is a fact that images impact our conscious and subconscious far more than mere words. Very often, people make New Year resolutions. They write their New Year resolutions in the diary, but then they are promptly forgotten about. Somebody went to the gym on 7th of January and found there's such a huge crowd. All the machines are full. So he asked the manager, what's going on? The manager said, sir, don't worry. These are the New Year resolution people. <laughs> they clear off in another one week. So we make our New Year resolutions. And then they are promptly forgotten about. Because those resolutions are conceptualized in words that are written in diaries. And if we took one step further to visualize it as well, and to allow that image to sink in, it would not easily be forgotten. Before the days of email that was started by you all, we used to have the snail mail. And I remember so many times in college forgetting to post this snail mail. Yes, when I go walk to the institute building, I need to post this letter. And then I would realize that 10 days have gone by. Every time I say I'll post, but I forget. But then I thought of a trick. Okay, now let me visualize the letter is huge. So in my mind, I had a huge image of the letter and that little post box, and I'm putting this huge letter into the little post box. I just held that image in my mind for a few seconds. It would not go easily, because images like the saying, the saying is correct that an image is worth a thousand words. This was a scientifically researched finding at the Michigan State University where in the emergency ward, 200 patients were surveyed. When patients are released from the emergency ward, they are given instructions. So half the group was given written instructions and also explained what is to be done. The other half was given written plus visual instructions and explain what is to be done. After 15 days, the researchers rang them up 
to find out what percentage of the instructions they remembered. The group that had received written instructions remembered only 6% of it. And the group that had received visual instructions remembered 43% of it. That's because we often learn things with the help of images. If I ask you to think of your father or mother, you will do, first thing you will do is to bring their image to yourself. If I ask, if you go down after your work hours to the parking lot, you're searching for the car, the greater chances you have the image of the car in your mind. You don't look at the number right away. And you keep seeing, okay, is the the car which is matching the image in my mind? We are always thinking in terms of images. But if we can create a healthy image of ourselves, again, it will help in reprogramming the subconscious. This is utilized in the spiritual field where they say, in your meditation, you bring an image of the Supreme in any way you wish. And make that as the basis for cleansing your inner being and for attaching your mind to that. So the same principle of visualization, if you wish to make spiritual progress or if you for your material fulfillment, happiness, prosperity, and well-being. And this is the way the subconscious works and this is the way it can be programmed with self-talk, self-affirmation, and visualization. Thank you all very much.